Okay, in this session for the MSc Cancer Biology students on the cellular and molecular basis of uh, cancer module, we're going to be discussing the role of cancer stem cells and their potential role in treatment failure. So in this session, we're going to cover some of the hypotheses and controversies associated with cancer stem cells. So we're going to cover the cancer stem cell hypothesis. So looking at the possibility of cancers being driven by a relatively rare uh, stem cell subpopulation within them. We're going to look at definitions of what cancer stem cells are or might not be and see whether the current definitions uh, work for all cancers. We're going to discuss why cancer stem cells might cause treatment failure and what can we do about that. And we're going to study, uh, look at the models that are used to study cancer stem cell populations and ask the question, are they adequate or inadequate? Uh, maybe look at more appropriate models for studying cancer stem cells within cancers. So to get started on this topic, we need to cover what the cancer stem cell hypothesis is. And the cancer stem cell hypothesis states that within a tumour, there is only a subset of cells that are able to propagate tumour growth, uh, induce metastatic growth, and also, in some cases, resist therapeutic intervention. So this means that the majority of a tumour is not able to repopulate that tumour. So if you were to take some random cells out of a tumour and implant them somewhere else in the body, they would not propagate a new tumour or would not create a metastasis or would probably uh, not be resistant to chemotherapy, whereas a rare cancer stem cell population might be the root of the cancer. And there are various uh, hypotheses about what these cancer stem cells might represent if they indeed exist and that could be that they are transformed tissue stem cells so if you think about most tissues there is a stem cell population which differentiates into differentiated cells and those that cells then do a job if those tissue stem cells become transformed they might represent a cancer stem cell population uh, it, they might represent cells that have never differentiated um, uh, and they're not fully differentiated, so maybe somewhere between the stem cell and the differentiated cell. Uh, and there could be cells that have differentiated but are then reversed and undergone what we call phenotypic plasticity to de-differentiate to acquire stem cell characteristics. And there is evidence that in different tumour types, all of these three things may well be true. So there are two competing polar opposites hypotheses relating to how cancers are maintained and propagated. There's the stochastic model, which is the old view that if you have a tumour and you take a single cell from that tumour, any single cell from this tumour will be able to generate a new tumour. And all of these tumours would equally be uh, drug sensitive or drug resistant, and any cell from the primary tumour could potentially induce a metastasis. And we've got fairly strong data to suggest that this is not necessarily always true, but in some cases might be. On the complete polar opposite to that, we've got the cancer stem cell model where we have a tumour here. And within that tumour, there is a rare subpopulation of cells. So if we were to take this tumour and take any one of these six cells, these five here would not be able to initiate long-term growth of a tumour or would not be able to induce a metastasis or would not be able to resist therapies whereas this cell could and this cell could give rise to more stem cells and give rise to more tumour cells so basically recapitulating the original tumour. So the cancer stem cell model suggests that this is what's going on. The stochastic model suggests that any cell can um, give rise to a new tumour. And this is summarised here, stochastic model, any cell can grow indefinitely, all or most cells have the potential to induce metastasis, and all or most cells are equally able to resist therapy, whereas in the cancer stem cell model, it's cells with the stem cell characteristics that can self-renew, only these cancer stem cell light cells can induce a metastasis, and these stem cell features are crucial for resisting therapies. And we certainly know that stem cell populations are very good at efflux in chemotherapy. So maybe these are these cells are the primary drivers of um, resisting therapies. 
So we can discuss about what cancer stem cells might be and the dis definitions of cancer stem cells have changed over the past 25 years quite uh, significantly. So in the strictest sense, and this was the most contentious and initi uh, initial description of cancer stem cells, but might still be true for some cancers, and that is that these cells are, uh, the cells responsible for tumour growth are the neoplastic counterpart of a normal stem cell of the tissue where the tumour originated. So if we're dealing with prostate cancer, there are prostate cancer stem, uh, prostate stem cells in the prostate, they're alpha 2, beta 1, integrin positive, CD133 positive, CD44 positive. And we certainly know that those same type of cells exist within prostate cancers and they have stem cell features. So there may, 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 this may well be true in some cancers. In the broadest sense, we can say that a cancer stem cell population might be uh, where the malignant growth properties of a tumour are found only in a small fraction of the cells which are responsible for growth, maintenance of the tumour and recurrence of the tumour. So this is different to here. This is certainly saying that that stem cell, cancer stem cell population has to resemble a normal tissue stem cell, whereas this one is suggesting that it, it just, this, the population almost has the properties of a tissue stem cell, but it doesn't necessarily have to be one. Now there's some fairly strong evidence to suggest that in leukemias, that a transformed tissue stem cell may well be the uh, root of those cancers. Um, but there is very strong data in other tumour types, um, particularly solid tumours, um, melanomas for, for one, uh, where we think that that is certainly not true. So when we're thinking about a cancer stem cell population, we have to think about how the tumour develops and where the tumour comes from in the first place. And this is um, a diagram through um, an intestinal crypt, and it's looking at the uh, animal model of uh, APC null mice. So APC is the denimitaceous polyposis coli. It's part of the wind signaling pathway. And if we knock out the APC gene, we have um, some uh, constitutive wind signaling in um, these uh, cells within the intestinal crypt. So if we just take you through the model and we'll see why I'm particularly choosing this model. So in the base of the crypt, we have a stem cell population and that stem cell population is maintained as a stem cell population by mesenchymal cells uh, which help to um, define the stem cell niche. So we've got stem cells down here that are maintained as stem cells. Factors released from here and extracellular matrix proteins define these as stem cells. When we need to repopulate the intestinal uh, lining, these cells will divide and give rise to non-stem cells. So the stem cell will divide by asymmetric division to give rise to a stem cell, which will retain its position in the stem cell niche. And then we will have a transit amplifying cell, which will proliferate rapidly and move up out of the crypt away from the source of these stromal cell uh, derived factors. So these stromal cells are secreting Wnt factors and they will Whilst the stem cells are here, mean to help to maintain the stem cells, but as they move out the crypt, will encourage them to proliferate very rapidly. So, stem cell goes and undergoes asymmetric division. We have cells here which are no longer stem cells. They undergo rapid proliferation and they move up from the crypt until they reach a certain point where these Wnt factors from the base of the crypt are no longer acting upon them because these are relatively short distance acting growth factors. So once they get to this point, the cells stop dividing, they start to differentiate and become the lining cells of the GI tract. Now what we know about uh, particularly colon cancer is colon cancers very, very frequently are caused by a double uh, gene deletion or disruption of the APC gene. The APC gene is part of a complex that maintains beta-catenin. So beta-catenin is a readout 
gene effectively of the Wnt signaling pathway and the cells move up the normal side here and go beyond this dotted line, beta catenin is off because there is no Wnt signaling. On the other side of this diagram, we have cells which are double mutant for APC deletion, so that these cells <clears throat> can no longer control the degradation of beta catenin, so that beta catenin is permanently switched on. So these cells move up from the crypt, come up to this point here, where they should no longer be receiving signals from these stromal cells, and they continue to proliferate. So this is what happens when you have a double knockout of APC, these cells continue to proliferate, whereas in the other side of the crypt, where the wild type, <clears throat> they do not proliferate. Now this is the first step towards cancer formation, and this creates a <clears throat> small polyp, or a small adenoma, and then subsequently this population of cells here will acquire additional mutations, such as KRAS mutation, which will um, then help those cells, sort of promote those cells into going down the carcinogenic route and eventually becoming a fully fledged cancer. So the question is, where does the mutation that gives rise to a double APC uh, mutant polyp arise? And that can arise in the stem cells. So there's no reason to say that the initial mutation doesn't have to be in the stem cells. So if we assume that this stem cell is APC null and this is, um, so in this situation, all of the subsequent cells would be APC null, and then we have an APC null small tumour developing, and that can develop additional, um, that can uh, develop additional mutations. The question is, what would happen if this cell here was the root of this cancer, but we selectively ablated this cell here, so that we got no more cells joining this tumour up here? The question is, would this lesion spontaneously regress or would this lesion continue to grow? And this is one of the key things that you need to think about in thinking of this cancer stem cell hypothesis because if by selectively ablating this cell here that is APC null you got rid of this then the cancer stem cell hypothesis states that uh, you know, the cancer stem cell hypothesis that is driven by a transformed stem cell is correct. However, if this is now self-propagating, then that whole idea is false. So, to understand uh, stem cells and uh, their progeny in a little bit more detail, we'll look at um, how we get typical epithelial tumor genesis. We have stem cells in a stem cell niche here typical of all epithelial tissues. Those stem cells give rise to trans-amplifying progenitor cells, and then they will eventually produce a large body of cells which will differentiate into maybe secretory basal, neuroendocrine, or squamous epithelium. So the single stem cell here can give rise to both the basal and the secretory cells of the prostate or the breast. So the different scenarios that we can think about, um, about where the initial mutation, what is the cell of origin of various cancers? And we can think, well, if the mutation occurs here, why are most cancers of the same general phenotype? So for example, in prostate cancer, the, the vast majority are adenocarcinoma, so secretory epithelial cells. And what we think happens, or what has been shown, if, if you search for papers um, using the term uh, cell of origin for various cancers, you'll find that the stem cell population, if mutated, uh, is a, the normal stem cell population is all able to become either basal or secretory epithelium of the main types, but also neuroendocrine as well in the prostate, for example. Whereas when that cell becomes mutant, it loses the ability to go down the basal route and all of the cells deriving from this mutant cell here all become secretory epithelial cells. They have lost their ability to differentiate down multiple pathways and they all go down the secretory route. And when you actually look at a cross-section through prostate tissue, one of the things you often see is a complete absence of basal cells and all of the cells in there are more secretory epithelium. It's not that the basal cells are being muscled out, it's the fact that they can no longer come from this 
stem cell because this stem cell is mutant. However, that's assuming the mutation comes from there. If the mutation occurs here in a differentiated cell, then why do some of these cells have stem cell characteristics? And what we know is that these cells can become mutant and that these arrows that are pointing in this direction are actually double-ended arrows and we can get de-differentiation back this way. And we'll call that phenotypic plasticity. And epithelial to mesenchymal transition is one of those examples of phenotypic plasticity. Alternatively, maybe a mutation happens here or here or here, somewhere between a stem cell and a differentiated cell. And this may explain that we have a single cell population that has features of secretory cells while still retaining some features of stem cell like cells but maybe they've already committed to going down the epithelial secretory lineage and therefore no longer basal cells. So all of these possibilities are there and in some cancers this may be true, in some cancers this may be true and in some cancers this may be true. Now coming back to the um, colon GI tract model that I talked about a couple of slides ago. Maybe it is true that the cancer stem cell population is absolutely crucial for initial propagation of a cancer. You know, well, when I say cancer stem cell, a stem cell population. But will this tumour really regress if we get rid of these stem cells? And the experimental evidence is in some cancers, yes, it will. And in some cancers, no, it won't. So maybe in some cases, a mutation of a stem cell is crucial for the in initial propagation of the cancer, but maybe at some point the cancer then becomes effectively stem cell independent once these cells here have got the genetic mutations to be stem cell-like or have unlimited replicative potential. Um, so sort of what we know from this sort of model is that when we lose APC, in a single cell, that single cell gives rise to the entire tumour. It doesn't happen repeatedly throughout the tumour, it only happens once. So there's fairly strong evidence when you think about it that way that this is no longer dependent upon this cell. Now one of the problems with this lecture is I can't give you any certainties. Um, different tumours have this evidence to support uh, and oppose the cancer stem cell hypothesis in different tumour types. Um, but it all raises really important questions such as which cells should we be studying if we're going to design an anti-cancer therapy. So should we be targeting therapies to cells from cancers that look like stem cells? Well it's a possibility and there are um, uh, pharmacological agents out there and strategies that do ex do this but how can we avoid normal stem cells if these look very much like normal stem cells. That is a potential problem because you don't want to necessarily wipe out all stem cells. Um, in some tumour types, must a stem cell be mutant to establish a tumour? Well, very possibly in leukaemia, very, very strong evidence for that. But for some solid tumours, maybe this is just not the case. So therefore, we might be looking at the wrong cells. There are also cells within cancers that don't necessarily look much like stem cells but have some stem cell characteristics and we know that this is most definitely true. We'll have cancer cells which express uh, cancer stem cell, uh, stem cell markers but they are not stem cells. Um, we know that in solid tumours we get quite a lot of phenotypic plasticity that is where cells effectively de-differentiate so they are terminally differentiated but then they de-differentiate back to resembling stem cells uh, and that could um, allow them to gain other phenotypes and respond differently to drugs. So phenotypic plasticity certainly is a major problem in cancer and that means that we don't actually always know which is the most primitive cell that we are going to try to target because it can be a, effectively a moving target. So if we're going to target either cancer stem cells or shall we call them tumour initiating cells which seems to be a much more relevant uh, name for them. Um, there are various things that we could try to do. 
So here is um, a stem cell undergoing self-renewal and then undergoing asymmetric division to give rise to more stem cells to replace itself and then the cells that are going to go on and differentiate. So here's the stem cells in the stem cell niche and here's the more differentiated cells. So different plans for, you know, different anti-tumor strategies could be to destroy the tumor initiating cells directly. And if the tumor initiating cells are propagating the whole tumor, the tumor should then regress. We could also deliberately try to differentiate the tumor initiating cells so that there are no stem cells left and then eventually the tumor should regress. And we know that this happens quite nicely in um, uh, some testicular germ cell tumors. We can make those cells differentiate by inducing DNA damage in them. Uh, those cells are, it's, it's to do with the NANOG uh, OCT4 SOX2 axis. Um, and there were some bonus slides at the end of this lecture relating to that. Um, but when cells receive DNA damage, they then differentiate down the, uh, they turn from being stem cells to non-stem cells and effectively uh, the damaged cells uh, eventually die out. Uh, and then the third way of, of potentially targeting these cells is targeting the stem cell niche. So whereas up here we're just targeting the tumor initiating cells themselves, if we can block the stem cell niche so that these tumor initiating cells sat in the niche are no longer tumor initiating cells, then hopefully that would result in tumor regression. That's probably quite similar to forcing differentiation as well, because that's all that would do. When the cells get booted out of the stem cell niche, they will differentiate. So all of these things are actively studied mechanisms to find out how we can cause uh, tumors to regress by somehow targeting a self-renewal uh, stem cell-like population. Okay, this is a good time to break off. Uh, this is the end of part one of the lecture. Uh, what we're going to do now is go onto Blackboard and there is um, an article by an author by Kelly. Um, and this is... Um, what I think is quite a controversial uh, scientific paper on cancer stem cells in leukemia and lymphoma. I want you to read that entire paper. Uh, that won't take long because it is only a single page paper. Uh, so it's a very, very short paper. But I want you to read that and have a think about um, whether that question, whether that paper is answering the cancer stem cell question in the way that is ideal. Um, and have a think about some of the points on this slide. So firstly, what they're doing in that paper is creating um, uh, tumour cells where there is a tissue-specific promoter driving an oncogene. So the emumic uh, model carries the cemic oncogene under the control of the immunoglobulin heavy chain enhancer. Promoter, so the promoter region of the immunoglobulin heavy chain, which means that the CMIC oncogene will only be switched on in cells that would normally express the immunoglobulin heavy chain. Now what this does is it forces transformation, i.e. tumour formation, you know, rapid proliferation by expression of EMIC, only after cells have differentiated from being hemopoietic stem cells down to a uh, specific hematological differentiation pathway where this gene would normally be switched on. So this, in my view, bypasses the tissue stem cell uh, population. However, uh, with that basic explanation of the paper, now's a good time to um, have a look at that paper and then coming up next will be a separate video with the second half of this lecture.